His name has almost been forgotten in this current generation, which is very sad. But when he was around, he was the most important political writer, the most important and most argumentative person of his period. So he was duly hated by the establishment, and he returned this in spades. He hated them and spent his life attacking them. This is a man who's taught by his father to read. He listens to stories of the American Revolution and his father is sympathetic, so he's inspired by it. Uh, he goes into the army eventually um, and he comes across corruption. He decides to act. It's a brave thing, he's a man of great courage. He goes to France eventually. He's in the thick of the French Revolution. He goes to America not long after the American Revolution. Um, he starts to stir things up between what was to become the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Uh, he makes friends, he makes enemies, he has to leave. He comes back to Britain. The Prime Minister is waiting to see him within weeks of coming back. Having nearly been done for treason when he left, he's a, get a dinner guest of the Prime Minister. He's offered a fortune. He turns it down because he will not be anyone's man. You know. He goes to jail because he sees people badly treated. He comes out of jail and he carries on the fight. Uh, even from prison, he's educating his children. He's introducing new methods of farming. He's a farmer, a horticulturist, a soldier, an educator, a political commentator. Part of Cobbett's legacy, which we mustn't forget, is that plenty of historians, famous ones like A.J.P. Taylor, quote Cobbett fondly. Uh, Richard Hoggart, who lived in Farnham, writes very approvingly and positively about Cobbett and his impact as a, as a radical writer and thinker, not thinker in the, in, of new philosophies, but turning ideas into some practical application. Cobbett is better known in America and mm. American students on, on university campuses than he is over here. Um, and not that, uh, you know, they, they, they have mixed views on him because yeah. he did stir it up. There's no doubt about it, he stirred it up. Um, when you think that French spies and, and even French diplomats were secretly having meetings with him in Philadelphia to try desperately to shut him up, no other British man was, was actually fighting the British cause. That's why when he came back, everything was forgiven about the treason. And he's, ooh, he's suddenly... But they found that he was an honest man. That's what we've got to get across that he tried desperately to be an honest man, and that's why he lost a lot of money. And he clearly had an influence on Karl Marx, and it is claimed that several of his verbatim comments have ended up in Das Kapital. Certainly the ideas about property have ended up in, in Das Kapital because he was very much against the idea that people should own a lot of land and exploit others. Um, and so he was, he was not a, against small-scale capitalism and running shops and running farms. He was against capitalism as exploitation, which is the... So, and in the Industrial Revolution, that's what Marx saw getting worse and worse and nastier and nastier. And uh, the source of some of his ideas comes from Cobbett. And if we can talk about the 21st century, the crisis we've just had, which came about with bankers manipulating credit, basically, money through wires and through the ether. He was warning us about that uh, back in the 1820s. He was inveighing against bankers like Barham, uh, not with hatred, but just saying, you are destroying the credit of the realm. You're building up a debt that we cannot pay. Sophisticated economists have criticized him for this, but actually uh, he's been right that if you build something on something that isn't actually there, it's all on credit, then you're into the land we call Spain, or Greece, or Portugal, or wherever. He was very, very modern. He was a modern man in many ways. Mm -hmm.